Ron Sider wrote The Scandal of the Evangelical Conscience. What is that scandal? According to Dr. Sider, the scandal is that many who profess to be evangelical Christians, to be born again believers in Jesus Christ, live out a morality that's not much different from that of those who make no profession of Christianity at all. For a religion that makes such bold claims as, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come, 2 Corinthians 5.17. And that talks about perfecting holiness out of reverence for God, 2 Corinthians 7 verse 1. This is, well, a scandal. Dr. Sider cites Gallup and Barna polls that reveal trends that should disturb anyone who claims to be an evangelical Christian of any denomination. Regarding honesty, covetousness, and materialism, for instance, the poll numbers among those who are professed evangelical Christians aren't so different from those of the so-called pagan world. Evangelicals divorce at the same rate as non-evangelicals do, maybe even a little more. And one poll revealed that about a third of all evangelicals believe that premarital sex is okay. I've read other polls that show that evangelical Christians display more racial prejudice than do non-evangelicals. And in regards to physical and sexual abuse, many evangelicals aren't doing better than the general population. And in some cases, they're doing even worse. Worse. Now what's going on here? How can this be? When asked about the cause of those disturbing numbers, Ron Sider hit the nail on the head. He said, cheap grace is right at the core of the problem. Cheap grace results when we reduce the gospel to forgiveness of sins only, when we limit salvation to personal fire insurance against hell, when we at best grasp only half of what the Bible says about sin. What the Bible says about sin? Yes, sin. Now the Bible defines sin in 1 John 3, 4 as transgression of the law. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. You know, every so often when you turn on to Sunday morning religious television, uh, you'll hear some preacher rail against sin, against transgression, against iniquity. And then in the next breath proclaim that God's moral law was done away with at the cross. Now, with all due respect, I humbly ask, if sin is defined as transgression of God's moral law, how can God's moral law be done away with? <laughs> how much sense does it make to rail against sin and at the same time to rail against the continued validity of God's law when we know about sin only because of God's law? Paul made it very clear in Romans 7, 7. I would not have known what sin was except through the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, do not covet. And Romans 3 verse 20, By the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Obviously, there's been some confusion on this topic within the Christian world. And this confusion probably has to do with the disturbing trends revealed in these polls.
Think about it. Why should we be shocked regarding this moral lawlessness among Christians when for years and years ministers have been telling these same Christians that God's moral law was done away with at the cross? Could this idea of what the cross did to the law be at the heart of the kind of lawlessness we're now seeing manifested in the church itself? I dare say that I think so. But Lonnie, someone says, hasn't God's moral law been fulfilled in Jesus? Are we not under law, but under grace? Aren't we saved by faith without the deeds of the law? Of course we are. As I've said more than once in earlier devotional talks, the best news on earth is the news about Jesus' substitutionary death on our behalf and about how we can stand pardoned, justified, and forgiven before God through the righteousness of Jesus, which God credits to us by faith. That and that alone is what saves us. Any New Testament Christian who understands the gospel knows that salvation is not by works of the law, but by Jesus Christ, whose life of perfect faith is credited to all who believe in him. But does that mean then that we're free to go on sinning, free to continue breaking God's law once we accept Jesus by faith? Is that what the gospel is all about? That's certainly not any gospel I find in my Bible. And I really doubt that you'll find it in yours either. Let me tell you about a woman, we'll call her Lola. Though Lola came from a decent home, well, she started associating with the wrong friends, pretty young. And by the time she was in her teens, she was into drugs, alcohol, petty crime, and so forth. Unfortunately, she married a real bad character who turned out to be exceedingly violent and who beat her constantly. Well, in time, having had enough of that, she murdered him. There being no question of her guilt, Lola went to jail. However, the governor gave Lola a pardon. She was set free. Though she had violated the law, though the law condemned her, though she faced the penalty of the law, the governor took it all away. He removed the condemnation that the law brought upon her. Because of the pardon, Lola was no longer under the condemnation of the law, despite being guilty of breaking it. Now, to clarify the point I'm trying to make, let me ask a couple simple questions. Does the fact that Lola was pardoned for her violation of the law, and that the condemnation of the law was removed, does this mean that Lola is now free to continue violating the law that had condemned her? Of course not. Does the governor's grace, which pardoned her, somehow make void the very law that she had broken to begin with? <laughs> That's a crazy idea. Grace didn't nullify the law, just the penalty of the law. Now, let's apply this analogy to the gospel. Sin, we saw, we saw is violation of the law, the Ten Commandments. And the Bible says that we are all sinners. Romans 3.23, all have sinned. But Jesus comes along with the gospel, the governor's pardon, offers us all pardon, forgiveness, and grace. The gospel doesn't say, keep the law, keep the Ten Commandments well enough and then you can be pardoned. No, it says Jesus offers you his perfect righteousness, and by claiming that righteousness, 
you can be pardoned for your violation of his law. Through faith, you're no longer under the condemnation of the law that you have broken. So, like Lola, those who believe are pardoned. But, does this mean that you're now free to go out and break the very law you violated to begin with, now that you've been given grace through Jesus? Of course not. God's grace doesn't nullify his law. It nullifies the condemnation of the law. That's a crucial distinction we don't want to miss. It's essentially what Paul was saying when he wrote in Romans 6, 1 and 2. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Since sin is defined as the transgression of the law, Paul could just as easily have written, What shall we say then? Shall we continue violating God's law that grace may increase? By no means. Now, Paul presents the same idea a few verses later in Romans 6, 14 to 15. Sin shall not be your master because you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Not being under law means no longer being under the condemnation of the law, no longer under the penalty of the law. By his atoning death for us, Jesus took care of that. Essentially then, Paul is asking whether we should continue in sin, should continue violating God's law now that we're no longer under its condemnation, thanks to Jesus' grace. His answer is, by no means. We mustn't confuse the fact that obedience to God can't justify us with the idea that we, well, we now don't need to obey God. This is a fatal delusion. And I believe that it's at the heart of the concerns that Ron Sider expressed in his book, The Scandal of the Evangelical Conscience. It's indeed a scandal when Christians live out a morality not much different than that of the world. Friend, have you fallen short of what you know is right? You can obtain forgiveness through Jesus. Not only will he forgive you, he'll also give you a new life in him, a life of faith and of obedience and Holy Spirit dynamite power to obey. The scandal is when we want the first part of that life and not the second.